So welcome here at uh, the Crowdsourcing Week in, in, in Brussels. You just uh, gave your, your, your talk uh, on, on stage. And we know each other from the 40 and the 40 network. So uh, yeah, uh, happy to see you over here again in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, what was your talk about? Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to have the chance to tell you a bit more about uh, what I presented today. My talk was uh, basically a pitch. Um, I've been trying to present a little bit the background uh, that has led to this entrepreneurial idea. It's about social entrepreneurship. It's about sharing the talents that many academics and professionals do have. But often those talents are not really channeled towards the right direction, meaning they, they stay where they've been conceived, meaning companies, uh, meaning companies that, whose main purpose is basically making profits. So the big question is how we can tap into the potential of those individuals um, and into their individual talents and bring those talents to the service of society. And uh, what we thought about with the good lobby is to possibly channel this expertise into the policy process and helping those interests which are less represented uh, like consumer interest, um, social interest, uh, diffused interests like the environment or societal concerns and, and find a way to have these interests represented by mainly non-profit organization. So basically what we do is to link um, the experts, the academics, the professionals with the non-profit associations, notably NGOs who are advocating for those interests. So we link the two and uh, we also allow students to benefit from this experience because they're also going to be part of these projects. Okay, so cool. that's our methodology that we've been uh, experimenting over the last two years. And, 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 and who is we? When we say we is, is the good lobby. So is um, a non-profit company uh, made of a core team of around 10 individuals coming from all over, mainly Europe, who have been helping me in creating the network of academics, the network of professionals, and the network of NGOs in developing this platform, enabling this, uh, this connection uh, happening. So that's the we. It's quite a, a big we. We're talking about around 70 individuals, professionals and academics willing to provide their expertise pro bono. And then on the other side, we have around 30 NGOs, mainly based in Brussels, but quite international. Uh, we have some big ones like WWF, Amnesty International, Transparency International, but also smaller one like uh, Accessing for Europe or even grassroots movement who do not really know how the European Union works. They would like to have a try to persuade their elected or some actors here in Brussels in the policy scenes and we help them to be present in town. Okay, and, 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 and what way do we make the link? Uh, because is it a platform or are you organizing physical events? Well, it is, it is a platform, so we basically listen to people. That's our first step, we listen. Uh, people uh, register on the platform and they tell us which is their need. These are NGOs. We need to have help in putting together a memo, a policy position, a policy paper in order to defend a particular issue. We are against fracking. We are against uh, non-conventional oil. We don't want to have our territory drill, which are the arguments you can come up with. And then once we listen, we process this information and we match this demand with the supply of the expertise. So we knock the door at the professor who are the profession. Usually we have both a young professional, might be a lawyer, might be an economist, and an academic who is a teacher, who is a researcher, and we match them together. So we create this team of people, plus some students, and the team will be working in contact with the client. So in a way, we work like a clearinghouse, matching the demand with the supply of a particular service. Okay, cool. And, 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 and what are the motivation factors for the professionals uh, to join also on long term? Well, for the professionals, notably those working in the private sector, I think when you look at millennials, so younger generation, you see that there's this desire to make a difference and to have an impact in life. And they would like to devote two or three hours per week for a particular cause. They feel very, uh, very uh, a lot about. And these, uh, these opportunities really like a commodity. They just knock at our door because Instead of having a, I don't know, a latte at Starbucks, they prefer to have two hours working with our professionals and our NGOs. 
So I think for them is, is a different kind of experience, different kind of professional experience, and they see this kind of social purpose um, taking place. Yeah, and, 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 and it's really uh, 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 about questions, so it's not about long-term uh, relationships, it's, it's more about really clear questions. And in and, and what way do you filter the right questions? Because maybe uh, in the end you will get lots of questions of lots of NGOs because everybody wants something from you and, it's for, and, it's, and they don't pay for it, so uh, that also motivates them to ask even more questions. Absolutely. So in what way do you make sure that they are uh, asking the right questions that, is, that, that will going to help them? but also that we're going to stimulate and motivate the experts uh, to, co to continue uh, working with the platform. Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. That's what we call quality oversight challenge. So how can we uh, exercise quality when we have done the match? So first of all, we do the filtering you refer to. So we cannot take all projects. We just take those projects which are clear, which are pertinent, which are somehow in line with what we believe being important. And once we do this kind of filtering, after a back and forth with the potential uh, client. Then we try to, to, to match the demand with the supply and we exercise some oversight by having regular calls with, with the team, with the client, trying to make sure that they get along well and that the deliverable will appear. So in average, our project they last around three months. So during the three months, we have uh, some intermediate steps. Uh, we check if everything is fine. And what we're doing increasingly is to have some internal capacity in my core team to provide a sort of safety net. So if the project is not going to be delivered by the uh, supplier we have identified, the academic or the professional, we try to possibly come up with a plan B. Okay. And this is interesting because we are learning more, we are developing more expertise, uh, but of course there's a capacity challenge. We're not going to be able to cover all those projects. So we, we tend to become more selective now, inevitably, and, um, and to work <coughs> with, uh, with new clients too. Okay, that sounds really cool. And, and, and you're now busy for two years. Um, and uh, what are your main challenges right now? Well, many challenges because basically we worked as a prototype for two years. We had uh, some funding from uh, New York University and HEC Pay, so the two universities I work for. And now the challenge is to scale the project. So we are working on, on, a, on a business plan that might make our project sustainable in the long run and um, therefore funding I would say is, is the challenge uh, in, in the scaling up and the second one is possibly to extend our methodologies to all new geographical areas. So we realize that for the time being being a platform works but we also need to have some physical offices across the EU. Yeah. So this is our second challenge in the scaling up of the project and we have um, an office in Paris, an office in Bilbao, Spain uh, and possibly we're going to go to Slovakia. So we are testing new markets, if you want, where we feel there is a need, where civil society is quite weak, where there's a need for expertise and there's a demand of academics, especially the new generations, to have this kind of engagement with society. So these are the two challenges. Funding, I would say, uh, in the scaling up and then the, the geographic location. So setting up some offices which are not too institutionalized but still they provide us a sort yeah. of entry point into yeah. new yeah. ecosystem we don't necessarily know. And then uh, what are your ambitions with the party? So let's say uh, you're now busy for two years and let's say we'll, we'll meet each other uh, uh, in two years. So what will happen? Well in two years time we would like to be certainly bigger in terms of size. Um, we would like to be more consolidated but the major challenge for us now will be, and the major ambition, is to move from a B2B model, in which we are pretty good at, because we have these networks, uh, to a B2C model. So allowing mm. citizens to possibly be part of the project by joining our teams, by supporting some project through some crowdfunding we haven't started yet. So we work on certain issues that make headlines, uh, that are pretty salient in the public mind. And we see that there is potential on particular projects to say, here we need some funding, please citizens help us. And it is not only about funding through money, but it might also be funding through help. So if we want to expand the scope of our services, we might need um, IT people, we might need engineers, we might need a set of professions that for the time being we do not include in yeah. our services, yeah. but in the future we might further expand. And moving bees to C might enable us to possibly broaden the scope of our activity. So yeah. this is possibly where we would like to be. On a B2C model where we basically commodify 
the civic experience of life where citizens say, well, I have two hours free a month or a week, I want to do something useful. And you, by clicking a few buttons, we're going to allow you to get there. Yeah. And this is certainly our mission, our goal. Sounds really good. So <clears throat> I wish you good luck with, uh, with that. Thanks for the interview. Thanks a lot. And let's uh, talk, uh, let's do the, do, do the interview again in two years and let's see where you are. It would be wonderful. <laughs> Great. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.